Well, as you can see, we're beginning a new series uh, post-Easter, and if you've been with us, you know that this is part of the year-long theme called The Story of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but this, this, this preaching through the story of Jesus has been transformational for me, and I've heard from many of you that it has been for you as well. In a sense, we're kind of going backwards in the story a bit, because we just talked about his resurrection. But there's a part of his life and teaching that we haven't examined in much depth, and that's some of the aspects of his teaching, and this story is called Kingdom Stories, this series. It's really looking at the parables. One of the unique ways that Jesus taught by telling remarkable stories that contain profound truths about what it meant to live life in the kingdom, to, be, to belong to God. The word parable, by the way, uh, comes from two, uh, two Greek words put together. Para, which means with or alongside of, and bale means to cast or set beside. So literally, para, parable comes from a Greek word which means to lay or cast alongside of. In other words, Jesus would tell stories that laid alongside ordinary events from their everyday life in first century Israel with deep spiritual truths, realities about the kingdom. Because there's some things about living life in God's kingdom that can't be um, defined, they can be, they can be described in story. And if you think about it, what we are given is not a bunch of definitions or bullet points. It's a story. One great, grand, beautiful, confusing, complicated, amazing, life-changing story. And we're going to look at some of the stories Jesus told, specifically beginning today with the parable of the Good Samaritan. Perhaps along with the prodigal son, which you'll hear next week, this is the best-known, best-loved, most famous of all the parables of Jesus. However, I, I would suggest it's also one of the least well-understood and one of the least properly applied of all of Jesus' parables, even though we presume to know it and have heard parts about it. I've preached on this parable before a couple of times, and I, for that reason I thought, well, maybe we should skip this over this one and do some other parables. But I thought, you can't skip this one. You can't leave this one out. It's so central to Jesus' teaching about the kingdom. And I, honestly, I don't know of 13 verses in all of the Bible that better describe God's heart for his people following him in this world. What it should look like, what it really means. It certainly captures my heart for who we are to be here at FBCG. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 10. We're going to read verses 25 through 37. Luke 10. And behold, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Again, I'm going to guess that this is a story you've all heard many times before and think you know, and perhaps you do. Let's just walk through it uh, and make some observations, because I think there's a, there's a whole layer of understanding, as it is with many of Jesus' parables, that often escapes us at first reading. In verse 25, back to verse 25 for a minute, we're told this man's an expert in the law. Who's this man? An expert in the law. What does that mean, an expert in the law? Well, not Roman law or civil law, like you think about law, like law and order, a, a, a lawyer, but religious moral law. Law specifically for the Jew meant the Torah centerpiece of which was the Ten Commandments, built around, uh, around which was built the first five books of the Bible. And that's what he was an expert in. The, old, the center of the Old Testament Jewish religious and moral law. 
knew it inside and out. And he, this man stands up. Do you notice that? He stands to ask Jesus a question. Now, typically in our culture, when someone is teaching, they stand and the students sit. And if you have a question in class, what do you do? You raise your hand, right? Yes, you have a question? Go ahead. Right, right. You raise your hand and ask your question. In that culture, rabbis sat down to teach. And the students would sit. And they would stand out of respect for their rabbi to address him and ask a question. So this man, an expert in the law, is seated listening to Jesus, who's also probably seated, and stands up to ask him a question out of respect. But something else in this first verse is he asked him a question to what? What does it say? Put him to the test. In other words, I want to catch him in something. I'm the expert. I'm going to set him up. I'm going to ask him a question, and based on his answer and some technicality then, I'll be able to prove that he's not who everyone thinks he is. He doesn't have the knowledge I have of the law. So already we see a man who, though he's religiously very educated, his heart and his actions are not in alignment, are they? He's standing up, showing respect, but his question is not respectful. It's to test Jesus. And what's his question? What must I do to inherit eternal life? The most crucial question. It is the most crucial question. How do, you, how do you inherit eternal life? What is eternal life? How does it come to you? How do you get it? Is there something you have to do? Do you earn it? Where do you find it? But we already know that he's not asking out of a sincere desire to know the answer, is he? He's asking this to, based on Jesus' answer to set him up, to trap him. Some legal technicality. Let's look at the next couple of verses. Jesus answers his question with a question, which is always a good idea when you're put to the test. However, it never worked for me when I was in school. Verse 26, let me ask you a question, professor. Right? Don't try that. He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you'll live. This is a fascinating exchange. The man says, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? What's it all about, Jesus? And Jesus says, you tell me. You're the expert, right? That's essentially what he says. He says, how do you read the law? Now, he's not asking this man to recite it, although he probably could have. He's asking him to sum it up. Sum it up for me, expert. Break it down, if you really want to know. And to his, to his credit, the guy gives a pretty good answer. It's the same answer, by the way, that Jesus gives when asked a similar question in Matthew 22, verses 37 to 39. What's the greatest commandment in all the, in all the, the, the law? Jesus says to love your Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love others. The guy says the same thing. They're both quoting from a centerpiece of the law, Deuteronomy chapter 6. So he gives the right answer. But he doesn't understand really fully what he's even saying. We'll, we'll see that in a minute. This expert is not really comprehending the depth of what he just said. This is the most important commandment. The most important question, how do you get eternal life? How do you have life, eternal life, not just someday floating off to heaven, but life now, life in the spirit, life eternally in your heart and flowing through your, your life now? Is that possible? How does that happen? It has to do with this commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Two, it's really two commandments wrapped into one, and you can't separate the two. We'll talk about that here as we go. First, the first half of the, the two commandments. Love God. Love is not static. Men, do you love your wives now, now better than when, the day you were married? I hope so. Wives are going, well, I don't know. Right? But because you know her better? You know, remember your starry-eyed, idealistic ideas about what marriage was going to be when you got married? And now that you've been through some storms together, you probably love her better. Women, do you love your husbands better than you did the first day you met him? I'm not talking about how you act all the time. I hope you do. Love is not static, it's supposed to grow over time. Do you love your kids better as they age? Yes, right? Do kids, you love your parents better? When, when you're young, you think your dad's Superman, and you figure out he's not Superman, right? But you love him better for realizing even his humanity. Love is meant to grow. And so it should be with our love for God. Love for God is meant to grow. It's not a static thing. It's not an emotion. We're meant to grow in our love for God. That's why Jesus quotes the commandment here, the man does, heart, soul, strength, and mind. Your heart, the things that you value most, 
Are they tied to the character and nature of God? Or are they just things of this world? The, your soul. Where do you find your identity and significance in life? What, make, what defines you? Is it wrapped up in the character and nature of who God is? Or in your career? The success of your children? Your strength. What do you strive after? What are you pursuing with your life? The things of God? And your mind. How do you love God with your mind? That's a weird one, isn't it? We think of love as an emotion and a feeling that's somewhere in here. And our mind is different. And separate, those are separate things, right? Your, your intellect and your emotions. That's not what he's saying. Loving God with your minds means thinking rightly and accurately about him. Growing and understanding who he is should affect how you feel about him. The depth of your affections for him and you're living your life for his glory. That's what I mean when I say do you love your wife, your, your husband, your son, your daughter, your mom or dad better as you get to know them? Yes. Growing in love for God with our mind means understanding him, growing in our understanding of who he is. Romans 12, chapter 2 says, chapter 12, verse 2 says this. We are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Meaning a changed life begins in thinking differently. Real transformation is not just breaking a habit. It's changing the way you think and see the world. How does that happen? You must feed your mind with the things of God. Let me ask you then. What are you feeding your mind with? Really? What are you cramming in there? What's most frequently being fed to the way your, your brain thinks? March Madness? Your bracket sheet, which was blown up when Michigan State lost? Right. Your children's schedules? Work obligations? Stuff on Netflix? Twitter? Facebook? Which I'm beginning to hate. By the way, can we, can, friends, can we make an agreement that Facebook should only be used for showing uh, your distant relatives, your kids, and your family funny stuff that makes you laugh and encouraging stuff? Stop taking stands on Facebook. It does nothing. Anyway, that's, I'm, I'm taking a stand. <laughs> hey, yay, somebody agrees. Right? All right. But we, we, we're cramming our minds with all this stuff, right? You will not change the way you think about God unless you're infusing new information about who he is. Where does that come from? Where, where could that possibly come from? Where would we get the stuff? I'm, I'm serious about this. If, you're only, um, if the only avenue that, by which you think about God is coming from you know, a, a verse of the day on Twitter or somebody's inspirational quote on Facebook or once a week a sermon that you hear on Sunday, that's not bad. It's just not enough. You must be in the Word of God if you want to love Him with your mind. You must. I've talked to a lot of people in our own church who are always quoting to me some, some new popular author, asking what I think of them. And I love to talk about authors and new ideas, but I, sometimes I get nervous. Like, are you reading His Word, the, the all-time bestseller? Are you reading the Word of God by which you can test all these things? Then you wouldn't have to ask me so much what I think. You'd know what you think based on what God's Word says. There must be a point beyond our one hour a week on Sunday where you are exercising your mind in love for God. Or you can't fulfill that first commandment. So loving God with your mind means growing an understanding of his character and nature, who he is and what he's like, so that you can love him better. You don't love someone you don't know. The more you know him, the more you will love him. Notice that Jesus also affirms that we need both love for God and love for others, that they're inextricably linked. They go together. There's no pause. Love for God and love for your neighbor, he says. Now, when you start talking about right doctrine, right theology, the need to proclaim the truth and hold fast to the truth, conservative people get very excited, and liberal people get very nervous. You notice that? But when you start talking about social justice and the need for mercy and the need for compassion and the need to live out our faith, liberal people get very excited. But conservative people get a little nervous, you know. And that's the, Jesus is saying, it's, I'm not conservative or liberal. Those aren't categories that define me. And they shouldn't define you as a Christian. You're beyond that. You need both deep, growing knowledge of who God is. That's what theology is. And a compassionate, mercy-filled life in the world. 
You have, you, you have one or the other, without, you have one without the other, and eventually it ceases to be Christianity. You get all doctrine without any exercise of love. That's not life-giving, that's not Christianity. You get all justice and mercy without understanding why or who's behind that. That's not Christianity. You have to have both. Both are absolute, absolutely necessary for the Christian. Loving your neighbor as yourself is, 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 let me put it this way, is your joy in this life at all linked to other people's joy? Now, ultimately, it shouldn't be. It should be linked, I mean, ultimately, your joy should be linked to Christ and him alone. But do you find any satisfaction and joy in the, in the joy of others? It ought to be, in that sense. Good theology should produce great love. And I spent way more time on that point than I intended to. So I'm going to talk very fast for the rest of the sermon. Only kidding. Look at verse 29 with me for just a minute. In verse 29. So Jesus says, you judge correctly. I love that. It's like, it's obvious, right? The guy quotes the center of the law, Deuteronomy 6, and Jesus says, give the boy a cigar. He doesn't say that. But he says essentially, yes, you got it. You got the right answer. Do this and you'll live. And the verse 29, but he desired to justify himself. Your Bibles might say, say it a little differently. Wanting to justify himself. Now think about that. He asked Jesus, what must I do? Jesus says, you tell me. He says it. And Jesus goes, good, you got the right answer. Do that. And he wants to justify himself. Why? He knows the weight of what he just said. Who can live that out? Which of us can love God and love others perfectly enough to earn eternal life? The man understands the, the significance of what he said. So, but so wanting to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? I love this. This is the quintessential, how far does this go? Will this be on the test? Do I have to know this? Like, who, how much of this, how far does this apply, Jesus? You certainly don't mean just anybody and everybody, do you? I mean, who is my neighbor? Let's put some parameters around this love thing so I can carry it out. Remember, he's an expert in the law. I want to know the legal requirements. How far does this have to go? So I can obey. It's really an amazing question. The expert wants to justify himself. Don't we all? Don't you sometimes want to justify your lack of love? Want to justify your disobedience? Want to put some limits around how far you have to go in love for God or others? In a sense, I think this man knows, uh, believes he knows what Jesus will say. Because to the Jewish worldview, your neighbor was your family, immediate and extended, your friends, the people of your village, of your tribe, of your line, and your fellow faithful Jews. These were your neighbors. And that's hard enough. But pagans, Gentiles, Romans, Greeks, those who reject God, don't acknowledge his existence, don't obey his law, or even see its authority, these are not my neighbors. These people are enemies of God, and therefore my enemies too. They're unclean. I'm not even to interact with them according to the law. So these are not my neighbors, right, Jesus? It's really, this is where there's some tension. I don't know if, you, if I'm communicating this well enough for you to get it. In the story, in the, in the encounter here with this man, there's some tension building. Well, who is my neighbor? Probably still wanting to trap him, but I think also wanting to know how far does this go? How far will he push this love for God and love for others? Let's look at verse 30. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Stop there. Jesus replied, that reminds me of a story. Let me tell you a story. In other words, the best way I can explain to you what love for God and love for others is, is like in the kingdom is through a story. Not by giving you like the bullet point list of things you have to do, but let me tell you a story. And it's a story that's going to blow all categories away for this man and it ought to for us. He answers this question with a story. It gets to the very heart of what it means to follow Jesus. Now he says a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now that road, there actually is really a road, and it really does go down. You'll see on the screen here an image of a map. In case you don't know much about um, is, is geography of Israel, on this map you'll see that 
Jerusalem there in the west, Jericho to the north and east slightly, is in the, what was called the Judean wilderness, right along the Jordan River, just north of the Dead Sea. A very barren, desolate place. Uh, Jerusalem sits about 2,800 feet above sea level. Jericho sits just shy of 1,000 feet below sea level. So it is 17 miles from, on that red line, and you drop 30, whatever, 30, 700 feet in elevation, almost 4,000 feet in elevation. It's a treacherous and difficult road. The first, next image you'll see here is the Jericho Road image first. This is an image of the monastery of St. George built right into and out of the rock along this road. This is a picture I took when I was in Israel from my, my awesome iPhone camera. That monastery of St. George has been destroyed and rebuilt numerous times. There are still monks living there. Their whole mission is to worship God by serving the travelers along the road, like the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's a Greek Orthodox monastery. That's right on the road Jesus is talking about, the old Roman road. To this day, there are black crosses that mark the passage, the ancient road from Jerusalem down to Jericho. The next image you'll see is from a, diff a further out distance, and this one I did not take. This is from good old Google. But um, you'll see that same monastery from a different view in that road in the distance, wandering down to Jericho. This is, Jesus places this story, this all-important story, in real familiar setting to the people of his day. They know what he's talking about, even if it takes us a little more to get it. Now, in almost every culture, uh, there's, the way you tell who are your kind of people is um, by the way they look, the way they act, and the way they talk, right? Do they look like us, dress like us? Do they act like us? Do they talk like us? Wear the same clothes as us? Have the same accent or dialogue, uh, uh, you know, dialect as us? Or do they look different, act different, talk different? And we know this. You go to different parts of the country, and people look different. They talk different. They act different. You go outside the country, and it happens as well. And you can kind of tell Americans. You can pick them out, can't you? Or people that are like you, even within the United States. But here's the point. This guy is naked and unconscious. He's not wearing anything. He's not saying anything. He's not doing anything. He could be anybody, which is precisely Jesus' point. Who is this guy? Any of us. Anyone. Is he my kind of person? Is he your kind of person? The usual tests don't tell. Verses 31 to 32 now. I'll read a little bit further. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him, passed by the other side. Now just so you know, this road was called, there's a pass on this road, not far from the pictures I showed you, called the, the Pass of Blood, or the Way of Blood. It was a place where people so frequently got jumped and robbed by highwaymen that it was very dangerous. You would never want to travel this place alone. So the fact that this guy's traveling alone puts him in jeopardy. It's not unlikely that he gets robbed, beaten, stripped, left to die. And along comes a priest. Now, it's very easy for us to be harsh on this priest, isn't it? How could he be a priest of God and not stop? What's with this guy? Jesus must have hated priests. Why would he tell this story? But let's, let's, before we pass judgment, let's try to be fair. First of all, the priest is probably not walking. He's riding. Priests were upper class, so he's likely riding a, a donkey. And he's probably, in Jesus' context, returning home from his two-week stint at the temple. You know, the temple in Jerusalem, the massive structure, the center of Jewish life. That was so big, the altar was constantly burning with sacrifices day and night. Uh, there was so much work to be done. It was such a big and busy place. There weren't enough priests in and around Jerusalem to service it all. So the surrounding villages, their local priests, would have two weeks, uh, three times a year, would go for two weeks and do their duty in the temple. This is common. So this guy's probably going home after two weeks in the temple. And he sees this guy lying on the road from a distance, because you could see down, right? You're going down. Ahead of you, you could probably see this man lying in the roadway. If this guy happens to be dead when he gets there, or if he dies in the process while trying to help him, this priest would, by Levitical law, become uh, defiled. Leviticus 21, you can look it up, touching a dead body. He would be unclean. By law, he would have to go back to Jerusalem, purchase a red heifer, turn that thing into ash, go stand at the eastern gate, and wait for another priest to come and pronounce him clean. This would cost him a lot of time, a lot of money, and it would be kind of embarrassing. You're a priest. How'd you let yourself get defiled? You should know better than that kind of thing. In other words, by his own religious code, it's very risky to help this guy. And he doesn't. His religion got in the way of his compassion, which would never happen to us, of course. 
Years ago, I was teaching as an adjunct professor at Wheaton College. They were, they were desperate to have somebody teach this class because the class was on, on sabbatical. So I taught a class for one semester. And I've shared this story before, but walking in, so it was spring, spring semester. It was cold like today, kind of blowing and not a very nice day. And I was carrying donuts, two boxes of donuts and a box of coffee for the students. Going to be a nice professor, bring treats for the, for the students. It was early morning class. And I'm hustling from my car into the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton College, and lying kind of in the alcove underneath the, the eaves of the, of the entrance is a homeless guy, clearly a homeless guy, um, African-American gentleman sleeping in the corner and kind of just trying to stay warm. And I rushed right by him, carrying donuts and coffee, going into class to teach about Christian ministry. You hear that? Walk right by him, carrying donuts and coffee, got to go teach my class on what it means to be a Christian minister. In the elevator, I felt God say, what is your problem? <laughs> Which I've heard before from God. So I <laughs> pressed the button, went back down, sat with the guy for a minute, spent a little time with him, prayed with him, and said, if you, still, if you come on inside, I don't know if I had authority to do that, but uh, told me we'd meet with him afterwards, and he was gone when I came back down after class. It wasn't much, but it could easily ha- has happened to me before, and I know it's happened to you too. Leaving Portillo's just a few months ago with my youngest son. We had all the food for our family. And my son likes to go through the bag, make sure everybody has what they're supposed to get. And he said, Dad, we got an extra hot dog. Great, I'm thinking. Another hot dog for me. Right? <laughs> On the side of the road is a guy who's got a sign. Please help. So I'm, it, I'm, I got the radio up, and we're going home. We're going to bring dinner for the family. And I'm not, I see the guy, but I don't do anything. And Ben goes, hey, Dad, we got an extra hot dog. Yeah, we do. Hey, Dad, we should give it to him. Oh, yeah, we could. But he's two lanes over. Hey, Dad. Roll down the window. Ben runs out over there, gives him a hot dog. Gets back in the car and he goes, it feels good to help people, doesn't it, Dad? I'm like, yeah, it does, Ben. Thank you. <laughs> my, my point is, you, we can easily, right, be in our own little tunnel vision of our life and what we think is we have to do and what's right and miss moments of compassion. And it happens to the priest in Jesus' story. I'm just saying, let's be a little more fair to this guy. He's more like us than we like to admit. Okay, then the Levite, who's, um, you ever wonder what a Levite is? Anybody ever wonder that? Levites are like junior varsity priests, except they're never going to make varsity. Is that helpful <laughs> to those of you that played sports? Like, they are, they are assistants in the temple functions. Some of them are worship leaders, they, they assist the priests, but they're never going to be a priest. They're not from the Aaronic line, but they are in the tribe of Levi. So they're, they're going to be serving in the temple, but they're never going to become a priest. So they're lower in the socioeconomic scale than a priest. This guy's walking, not riding. And he probably sees, because it's down, right, the priest stop. Or not stop, excuse me. And he thinks, well, if the priest doesn't help this guy, why should I do anything different? I mean, I don't have the resources the priest has. I don't know the law like the priest knows it. I'm bound by the same Levitical code. I have no business doing anything different, so he passes by. It's much easier than we would like to believe for our religion, our worldview, our politics, to get in the way of our compassion. Next up, a Samaritan. Now the story turns scandalous. Open your Bible again, Luke 10, verse 33. If you like to underline things, I would underline this phrase, this word. Verse 33, but a Samaritan. That's just a crazy turn. To us, we have hospitals and orphanages and charity organizations all named Good Samaritan, right? Right? But that's because of this story. In Jesus' day, this is like saying, the good terrorist. It just doesn't doesn't even register. A Samaritan? A Samaritan? Come on. But a Samaritan? Now, if you don't know much about this, Samaritans were not exactly Gentiles. They were actually despised sometimes even more than Gentiles because they ought to have known better to the Jewish way of thinking. Gentiles were, they're ignorant, they're outside the family of God, they don't have the law. Samaritans were, I won't get into the too much, we don't have time, but if you go back in, in the book of Ezra and before, during the Assyrian uh, captivity, Jews were taken away, some stayed behind, and those that stayed behind intermarried, uh, mixed religions, mixed races, and when the exiles returned, they viewed the, those people as half-breeds, traitors to the true religion. Hated them. and I mean, despised them. There are prayers in the Mishnah that say things like, Thanking, asking God specifically to withhold grace from Samaritans. God, pour out your blessing, but not on them, right? Not on that guy. There were also places that said that to eat the bread of a Samaritan was the same as to eat the flesh of a swine. To a Jew, it was unclean, unthinkable. 
So when Jesus says, but a Samaritan, this is like, whoa. The story is getting crazy now. And he goes to great lengths here to describe the compassion, how, how much it costs this man to help the, the di- dying, bleeding man, right? Gets off his animal, puts him on the animal, tends his wounds, pays the innkeeper, who promises to pay his debt, pours oil and wine. I mean, he, go, he, he goes into detail about what it costs this man. Time, expense, risking his own life if the robbers are nearby. Now, Samaritans, by the way, were not technically Gentiles. As I said, they also tried to follow the Torah. So the same law in Leviticus will also apply to this man to a degree. And the Bible, Jesus says he had compassion. Your Bible might say took pity on him. He was, the Greek literally means he was moved in his spirit with compassion for this man. Deeply moved. So his compassion trumped the racial, social, economic, and religious barriers that would prevent him from helping this man. I remember a man in our church years ago that wanted, he, wanted, he called me, or he actually, actually, excuse me, after a service, he said to me, I'd like to give some money to help families in need. I said, that's great, you should do that. He said, can I make an appointment to see you before I do? I said, of course you can. So he came to see me, and he said, he was talking about a fairly large sum of money. I said, this is so generous of you, I was so grateful. He goes, but listen, I'd like to lay out a few stipulations. I thought, oh, this is interesting. And he went on to describe the list of things that the families ought to be and do before they should qualify for his help. In other words, those that deserve it, by my standards, I'd like to help. I tried to explain to him, that's not exactly the way it works. Jonathan Edwards wrote a book called The Duty of Charity. Uh, he, he's a brilliant theological and philosophical thinker um, in 18th century New England, led a revival. And in this book, in this essay, he writes about the fact that when, if we only help our neighbor when it's no cost to us, then how do we fulfill the law to bear our neighbor's burden if we bear no burden at all? If we only help our neighbor when we think they deserve it, how does that fulfill the law of grace? By which Jesus looked at us, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not because we're deserving. He goes right down the list in 18th century New England about all the objections people would have to helping the poor and just tears them all down based on the gospel. It's very prophetic because the same excuses exist today and in Jesus' day. The Samaritan stops, takes the man, cares for him at great expense to himself. Verses 36, 37. This is, by the way, the most transforming message. We have the crucial question, the important command in in the transforming message here. Which of these three, Jesus says, do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Jesus asked a very simple question, but profound question, to this little story. Very often you'll see when he tells a story to somebody who he's interacting with, not in like a large group teaching, he'll ask a question following it up. Who, Who was neighbor? To this man. And notice what the guy says. He says what? What does the man say? The one who showed him mercy. Would it have been easier to say the Samaritan? He can't even say it. The one who showed him mercy. It's like a choking on the words. It's a bitter pill for him to swallow. And then Jesus like, drives the knife in and twists it when he says, go and do likewise. Be like that guy. Now this is how most people end the story, Right? That's it. Okay, you guys got it? Don't be like the priest. Don't be like the Levite. Be like the Samaritan. Let's go out there and try hard to be like the good Samaritan. Ready? Dismissed. What are you waiting for? Go. This doesn't have any power to change you, does it? This is moralism. Secular moralism is enlightened people, progressive people, you know, educated people should... Care for the poor. Religious moralism is the, law, the Torah, the Bible, the Koran teach us that we should care for the poor. The key word should. How many of you right now feel like you should be a better man or woman than you currently are? Show of hands. If your hand's not up, you're perfect or not listening. Right? Right? How, how many of you guys think I should, I should be a better husband than I am? I feel that way. 
better father, better wife, better mother, better son, daughter, right? All people live with a level of should in their hearts. I should be better. I should. And if the message coming from the Bible is you ought to, you should, you should, you should, you ought to, that doesn't change your life because you already feel that way. The, the key to this parable is something that, that most people, I think, miss, and I missed for years. What if Jesus told the parable this way? A man just like you was riding his donkey and saw a Samaritan lying there bleeding to death. That wouldn't change this guy. He wouldn't move him. He'd be like, I have no obligation to help him. Now, the key here is where does Jesus place this man in the story? Remember, he tells the story to the man's question. What do I have to do to get eternal life? The guy answers, love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. And, and he says, who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells the story to get at that question, my neighbor, and the ultimate question, eternal life. Remember, that's the context in which he tells the story. He's interacting with this guy who wants to know about eternal life and who is my neighbor. So he's, Jesus is telling it to get at that guy's heart. And he's always placing that person, and I think by inference, us, in the story. Where does he place the guy in the story? He's speaking to a first century Jewish expert in the Old Testament law. This guy would not identify with a, a Levite or a priest. He's not from that tribe or that class. I'm not a priest. I'm not a Levite. I'm not like them. I'm not one of them. I never will be because I wasn't born into that line. He would never in a million years identify himself with a Samaritan. They are to be hated and despised. He probably was incredulous at Jesus' suggestion that this is the good one in the story. So who's left? Who's left in the story? The half-dead naked guy. The guy in the road. Think about that for a minute. The story is not go out there and try hard to be good. The story is, what if you're lying in the road, bleeding out, and your only hope is that somebody who owes you nothing, who you treated as an enemy, would stop and save you. Notice the guy's question, who's my neighbor? Jesus says, who was neighbor to this man? He turns it around, doesn't he? He says, who's, who's neighbor to you? The gospel message is, you and I, spiritually speaking, are lying, dying in the road. We're going to die. We have no hope. We can't save ourselves. We can't magically heal our wounds, get ourselves up, and become less sinful and go on with our lives. We can't do it. We're going to die spiritually. But God comes into our world, our dusty road, if you will. Finds you, finds me, lying there by the road. And it doesn't just put us on his horse and pay an innkeeper. It costs him his life to save you. That, that's the message of the Good Samaritan. It's not go out there, try hard to be better. It's God loves you so much, but he owes you nothing. You treat him like an enemy. But he, he loves you so much that he would come into your world and find you and pick you up and die for you and forgive your sin and bring you into his family and love you eternally and give you the hope of heaven and give you security beyond the economy and politics and everything else and give you a mission in his kingdom and say, now because of my great love for you, which has healed you, which has saved you, now because of that, go and do likewise. Not out of duty and obligation because I have to and I should and I ought to. You see the difference? This is the heart of the gospel. Jesus tells the story not to make this guy feel guilty or to embarrass him, but because he loves that man. He wants him to see, for all of your knowledge, you miss the basic fundamental fact. You're the half-dead guy. Jesus is your good Samaritan. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this story, and we confess that we sometimes get this wrong. We're striving in our own strength to try to measure up and we labor with this guilt in our soul that we ought to be better than we are. But the truth is, we could never measure up. We could never earn it. We could never do enough. And because of our sinfulness, we are lying there dying. And yet you, God, love us with an everlasting love. You said you came to seek and to save those who are lost, and that's all of us. So we thank you for coming into our road and finding us forgiving us and saving us. And we praise you, Jesus, in your name. Amen.